We are broadcasting live from Children's Hospital of Wisconsin. My name is Corey. I work on the social media team. And today I'm joined by Jason Jarzembowski. He is the program director of perinatal pathology here at Children's Hospital of Wisconsin and an expert in safe sleep education and research. Today we are going to be talking about safe sleep for babies and the risks of sun infant death syndrome. So if you have a question for Dr. Jarzembowski or if you'd like to join this conversation, please go ahead and post your questions in the comment section of this video and we will try to answer as many as we can throughout our live broadcast. And for everybody watching right now, please go ahead and click the like button and let us know you're watching. So let's get started. Dr. Jarzembowski, could you first describe your role here at Children's Hospital of Wisconsin? Sure, I'm the medical director of the lab and of pathology, but I also serve as the program director for perinatal pathology, which is really everything that has to do with birth and uh, early infancy. Okay, and I, I see you also serve as a medical advisor to the Infant Death Center. What does that mean? Sure. The Infant Death Center is run by Children's Health Alliance, um, mm -hmm. one of our affiliated organizations. And what they do is they try to make sure that families that have experienced the loss of an infant um, have appropriate bereavement support um, and other uh, coping assistance. They also um, do a lot in terms of safe sleep education mm -hmm. as well as education about um, health and well-being for moms during pregnancy. Okay. Now I know a lot of folks posted their questions ahead of time for you and many of them were related to sudden infant death syndrome. So I'd like to get started with the question that Eve asked on our Facebook page. She asked, is SIDS when the baby stops breathing as a result of something physiological or is it when they are somehow accidentally suffocated by someone or something? So kind of hearing what Eve is asking, can you des describe what is SIDS? Exactly? Sure. So sudden infant death syndrome mm -hmm. is when a baby dies um, really unexpectedly and inexplicably during okay. sleep. Uh, and it can happen for a variety of reasons, but what we think is that what we really call SIDS is due to a problem the baby has with their, with their brain, the brain stem, which is in the back of the brain, and okay. that's the part of the brain that controls um, breathing and heart rate and things like that. And what we think happens is that these babies have some sort of an inborn problem with that area of their brain, and when they uh, don't have enough oxygen, for example, mm -hmm. whereas you or I would increase our rate of breathing, take mm -hmm. deeper breaths, they don't do that, and therefore um, they're more likely to just gradually stop breathing during their sleep. Uh, but we know that a lot of other babies that die during their sleep, uh, as Eve said here, are you know due to accidental suffocation and mm -hmm. things like that. So it's difficult to tease out which ones are really SIDS and which aren't, and that's why we do some of the studies we do in terms of doing autopsies and trying to investigate these deaths to figure out what really happened. Now, I think for many parents, um, SIDS is probably their worst nightmare, right? This this unknown or un, 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 maybe unpreventable? Help me understand, are there ways to prevent SIDS or steps you can take to reduce the risks of SIDS? Yeah, and so we know there are ways. So okay. back, in, back in the 1990s, um, the Centers for Disease Control, one of our uh, public health mm -hmm. organizations, actually created the huge back to sleep campaign where we first started for the first time putting babies on their back to sleep every time. Mm -hmm. And over the first 10 or so years that they did that campaign, we saw the rate of SIDS drop by half. Um, so we know that things like that can definitely help, and there are other things we suggest as well. Okay. Well, it looks like we have some questions from our live audience. Um, what do you got, Courtney? Yeah, so Becky asked, my son is over a year and keeps hitting his head on the crib bars during the night. Is it okay to put bumpers on his crib now that he's older? Um, so that's a parental choice. Uh, I, what we recommend, uh, the, the, excuse me. The information we provide is really geared towards infants under a year of age. Once an infant's over a year of age and they're moving around enough to bump their head, uh, they usually have enough motor control and really uh, self-control during sleep that those things don't pose a problem. But it really depends on uh, your baby, and I'd recommend you talk to your pediatrician about that. I think, and then we just had one more that um, kind of goes off the crib bumper topic. Bumpers are discouraged, but what about mesh or like breathable ones? Yeah. So we actually dis, uh, we, uh, we refrain from supporting any of that. Um, we think it's better not to have either bumpers or mesh. They're all just things that the baby can get entangled in in some way or another. So we discourage any of that, recommend really an empty crib. Okay, well let's talk about this empty crib and some of the, the, safe, the safe sleep environment we want to create for babies. Many of us have heard the ABCs of safe sleep. What, are, what do you mean when we say the ABCs of safe sleep? Sure, so when we talk about the ABCs, we're talking about the baby being alone, A, alone, um, 
in a crib, so we want nothing else in there, uh, no toys, no loose blankets, nothing like that. When we say B, back, so as I was saying before, mm -hmm. baby should be put on their back for sleep. And then C is in a crib or in a pack and play. So it should be a, a surface designed for an infant to sleep. It shouldn't be an adult bed, it shouldn't be a couch, it shouldn't be anything like that. It should be a flat surface like a crib or a pack and play. And if you break those down, so alone, um, I know as a parent, there's this instinct to want to put something in the crib, like a stuffed animal or maybe a favorite blanket or something. And when we're talking about babies from zero to 12 months old, they're saying there are a risk associated with anything else in the crib. So what might a baby do that could present a risk to them? Sure, absolutely. So we've seen cases where babies can actually um, get blankets in their mouth or over their face really? and suffocate that way. Hmm. Same with stuffed animals. Um, loose hats, other things like that. That's why we recommend being completely empty. If they need a blanket, you can papoose them in the blanket or have a blanket tucked on three sides so that they can't get it up over their head. Okay, and so putting a baby on their back makes sense, right? Um, I would imagine that at some times, maybe a child might roll to their side and um, wondering what should a parent do if you see their child wanting to roll to their side? Is it okay to put, just keep putting them on their back or how does that work? Sure, and we've actually, we've gotten questions from parents mm -hmm. who have essentially spent the entire night getting up every 15 <laughs> minutes to put right. their baby back on their mm -hmm. back. Um, the point is to keep the baby on their back when they don't have that motor control to be able to move around at all. Mm -hmm. So likewise, if you put them on their stomach, they would stay on their stomach face down, but we put them on their back where they're safer. Once they start to grow um, and start getting closer to that year old mark, they're able to move around. They can roll onto their side. That's fine. Once they can start rolling, we just let them roll, but just put them down on their back initially. So when a child is on their back, what what risks are they avoiding in that scenario? So what we think can happen, with, which triggers SIDS and also can be a uh, a risk for your accidental suffocation is when the baby's on their side or on their stomach, their face is down into the mm -hmm. bedding. And even an infant mattress is usually soft enough that, and their faces are, you know, mm -hmm. cute and squishy, <laughs> but they can switch down into the mattress and they can actually get into a spot where they can't really breathe very well and they form a pocket of air without oxygen that really gets a lot of carbon dioxide. And we think that can trigger SIDS. Okay. Um, we have a question here from Rebecca who had asked, my son is three months old and will only sleep on his stomach. We spent three days and nights trying to get him to sleep on his back, and he'd wake up immediately if we laid him on his back. What are the risks of SIDS if he continues to sleep on his stomach? So I guess you know, this sounds like a parent who maybe um, wants to do the right thing, but mm -hmm. is finding it challenging or frustrating, right? Absolutely, right. And so I can certainly, you know, I can connect with this person. Mm -hmm. um, my, my child was colicky for the first couple <laughs> of years, um, and it's really miserable. But ultimately, you're doing the best thing for your kid by putting them on their back. Um, it, sometimes you need to um, transition them so they get them to go to sleep somewhere else and then move them. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you need to use other soothing and coping mechanisms. And oftentimes pediatricians have some advice for this. Okay. Um, but we definitely, you know, recommend putting them on their back. Uh, eventually, they're tired enough that they will fall asleep. Yeah. Um, of course, you know, as a parent, you'll be tired too at that <laughs> point. But um, so the C here is in a crib, and so you said in a crib or pack and play. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd imagine the crib should have a mattress that's relatively firm, mm -hmm. correct? And so is a pack and play just as safe as a crib? I mean, there are other options maybe, or? Yeah, you know, a pack and play is just as safe as a crib. Okay. Um, you know, again, it's a flat surface like that. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have loose bedding in there, um, and it's perfectly comfortable for the baby and perfectly safe. If you don't have a pack and play, I mean, that's where, you know, even a cardboard box can do that sort of thing. You just need a flat place for them to mm -hmm. sleep. Uh, and that's really all we recommend. Again, like you said, it needs to be a mattress designed for an infant, not an adult mattress, not a couch, nothing like that. Sure. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Talia who asked, the Fisher-Price Rock and Play was recommended to me to help my sweet boy with reflux sleep better. This product is marketed as a sleeper. Is there an increased risk of SIDS if baby sleeps in something like this instead of a bassinet? So actually there is, unfortunately. Okay. Um, and we see um, babies who unfortunately have died in those so-called sleepers, who have um, died in uh, bouncy chairs or those vibrating chairs, yeah. or even in car seats. Um, part of the problem there is even though you've got them in a spot where they can't roll over onto their stomach, um, it doesn't have the net support, and they oh. can actually flop forward and cut off their airway that way because they don't have the net strength to pull their head back up. Okay. So while some of those things can be really useful, as I said before, for getting your baby to sleep um, or you know putting them in a safe place while they're awake mm -hmm. uh, we don't recommend them for sleeping 
Okay. Uh, for everybody listening right now on Facebook, please go ahead and click the like button and show us that you're listening. We'd really appreciate that. It looks like we have another question from our Facebook fans. Yes, yeah, so Aaron asked, sounds like we're talking about a new product. Is the new Resty a safe back-to-sleep option? Are you familiar with that product at all? I'm at, R-E-S-T-E. I'm actually not familiar with that product, so I can't really comment on that. I can tell you that um, both the federal government and the American Academy of Pediatrics routinely look at products, um, and there's nothing that they've endorsed in terms of keeping babies safe, whether that's a, a special sleeper, whether that's a monitor of some sort. They don't recommend any of those. They really just recommend a simple crib or pack and play. Uh, one thing we talked about a little bit earlier in the broadcast um, with, with bumpers or mesh along the side, and just help us understand what the risk is for a child. Is it, is it that they would roll to their side and press their face against it? Is it they would swallow something? Yeah, so with bumpers and mesh, it's usually that their face gets pressed up against the side. So even though the baby mm-hmm. isn't able to roll, they can still kind of swarm on their way over, mm-hmm. um, and they get their face up against the bumper or that mesh and, and suffocate that way, unfortunately. So I would imagine parents are... In, are imagining perhaps that their child's foot or leg will get caught in there and they're imagining that risk but really the risk of suffocation against that crib bumper or mesh is much higher than probably exactly. anything else yep. right um, what about what a baby should wear to sleep I mean when you put your child down for a nap or at, at nighttime what is is there something recommended the child should wear right so you know really whatever is comfortable for the baby we do recommend sleep sacks if you um, instead of a blanket because that's something that clearly you know because mm-hmm. it's zipped up it'll keep the baby warm especially mm-hmm. important here in Wisconsin, yeah. um, but also won't present the hazard of, of a loose blanket. Otherwise, really, you know, whatever they're comfortable in. If they're snug-fitting pajamas, that's great. If, you know, they're just in a diaper, that's fine. Um, the general rule of thumb is to dress your baby one layer warmer than you would be. So if okay. you have, you know, just a T-shirt on, they need a T-shirt and something else. Um, but again, try to keep it snug-fitting. Use a sleep sack instead of blankets if you need to. Okay. Uh, we have a question here from Molly on Facebook who asked, I've read SIDS risk is lower if the room is kept cooler. My baby seems to run warm all the time, so I'm hesitant to use a swaddle or sleep sack, but she seems to sleep better in them. What are your thoughts on room temperature and sleep sacks versus just a onesie or jammies? Now, you mentioned the temperature of the room. Can you talk yeah. about that a little more? So there have been a couple of studies that have suggested that if a baby gets overheated, um, it could increase the risk for SIDS. Mm-hmm. There was also an interesting study that showed if you had a fan running in the room, that the SIDS risk appeared to be lower. Um, part of that may just be due to the ambient noise that actually keeps the baby from falling into a very oh, deep yeah. sleep. Okay. <laughs> But what, again, you know, what we recommend is whatever's comfortable for you is probably mm-hmm. comfortable for your baby. Um, you know, if if you think they're overheated in a sleep sack, if they look sweaty, they you know start to feel really warm, then I think the jammies or a onesie are fine. I mean, really, mm-hmm. whatever's comfortable for the baby. Looks like we have some more questions from our live audience. Yeah, so I know we kind of touched on this, but this goes with the the B of the ABCs. So on your back. Um, so Erin had said that her son is seven months old and he's rolling. Now you said if a baby is rolling that's okay that they're rolling onto their stomach to sleep, right? Yeah. Okay, great. And then when can a baby start sleeping with like a family member or the co-sleeping thing? Can we get to that topic? So my rule of thumb is that it's perfectly acceptable for your child to sleep in the bed with you the night before they go to college. So the truth is we don't really know. We know that there are risks for kids that are under a year old when they co-sleep, either with siblings or other adults. It really hasn't been studied in over a year um, of age. So so we don't know what's safe. And it likely differs between different kids depending on their developmental stage and their other health issues. So just to be clear, when a child is under one, so from zero to 12 months, they should definitely not be sleeping with a sibling or not be sleeping with parents. Correct. correct? And that's the alone of the safe sleep. Right. right. So they should be, they should... You know, we talk about sharing a room and not a sleep surface. Mm. Uh, so you have, you know, you should have your baby in the bedroom with you, perhaps, mm. if that's more comfortable for everybody. Right. But have them in the crib and have the crib next to the bed or have the pack and play, you know, somewhere in the room where you can get to mm. the baby if you need to to help soothe, et cetera. But don't share a surface with them. And I think, you know, when I did a little bit of research on this topic, there appear to be myths out there about co-sleeping, like, you know, it's okay as long as you're not drunk or it's okay if you're not impaired in some way. It's, I mean, that definitely is a risk. But the, the inherent risk of sleeping in a bed next to another human on this really soft 
surface, I mean, all of the risks combined really make it a, a bad idea. Absolutely. And every risk you add, whether it's another object in the bed, whether it's a fit person mm -hmm. in the bed, whether that person is, you know, incapacitated mm -hmm. in some way, just increases the risk of something bad happening. Mm -hmm. When we look at the data um, in Milwaukee here, when we've looked at safe sleep de unsafe sleep deaths over the years, mm -hmm. um, really a small minority, less than 20% of those have had a parent who's, you know, been under the influence of mm -hmm. alcohol or drugs. So clearly in most cases, it's the parent who, you know, while maybe tired, is not under the influence of anything. So that's clearly not, you know, a mm -hmm. safety uh, And if your instinct factor. is to have your child close to you, then have them in the room, right? right have a bassinet exactly. in the room or have the crib in the room. Yep. All right. Looks like we have some more questions from our live audience. So when is it okay for a child to start, or a baby, I guess, to start sleeping with some sort of, like, teddy bear, a stuffed animal, a toy, um, you know, a blanket or whatever, any of that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, again, we, we use the one year of age rule of thumb in general, but again, it's going to depend on your baby, their developmental stage, et cetera. And, you know, without knowing the details, I'd have to refer people to their pediatrician to assess that. Okay. Um, some of the risks associated with the SIDS, um, could they be lowered, for example, if you were breast, a breastfeeding mom, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so we know that breastfeeding mm -hmm. um, appears to be protective, mm -hmm. um, and we know that there are risk factors. So we know that a baby that's born, born prematurely is at a higher risk. We know that babies that are born underweight, low birth weight, are at risk. We know if there's smoking in the home, if the babies are supposed to smoke, either during pregnancy or after birth when they're in the home sleeping. Um, so that, even that's like secondhand risk. smoke? Secondhand smoke right? is definitely a risk factor for SIDS, yeah. Oh. Now, I know we talked a lot about um, putting your baby to sleep at night. What about just a quick nap during the middle of the day? I mean, yeah, so these rules apply anytime your baby goes to sleep. As a, as a parent um, myself, I could imagine that, you know, I might not be the only one caring for my sleeping baby. Maybe it's my babysitter. Maybe it's mom and dad, grandma, grandpa, aunt and uncle. What responsibility does a parent have in sharing this information with the folks that may be helping care for the child? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think I think it's important for parents to always communicate those mm -hmm. expectations just to whoever's watching their child, whether it's uh, relatives, whether it's friends, whether it's daycare, mm -hmm. other settings. Um, you know that that you practice safe sleep and you want them to do so too. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of daycares now are licensed and have that sort of educational. Mm -hmm. uh, component built in where they always follow safe sleep practices. Others are a little looser about it, so I think it's important to find that out, either when you're visiting or when you talk to them about it. Mm -hmm. And with relatives, you know, this is a generational thing, just like, you know, 30 years ago, not everybody wore seat belts all the time, and doctors <laughs> recommended cigarettes. We've learned more over the years. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's, you know, I think it's important, especially when there are older relatives who, you know, were raised in a different generation with a different mindset to mm -hmm. communicate what you want for your child. Looks like we have some more questions from our live audience. Yeah, so is there any information or, um, you know, facts that you can provide on the sleep monitor devices? Is there anything that, any of that would have to do with SIDS? So, you know, there are sleep monitors out on the market that are supposed to help you, you know, notify you if your baby stops breathing or mm -hmm. something changes. Um, and those have been tested and found not to reduce the risk of SIDS. Mm -hmm. um, what they do is they increase parental anxiety because um, <laughs> they go off a lot, etc. So unless your baby has a specific health condition mm -hmm. and, for example, got sent from home from the hospital with a specific monitor, right. otherwise we don't recommend those at all and neither do most of the major organizations. And then um, we also had the question, till what age can we stop worrying about SIDS? It's called the infant death syndrome, mm -hmm. but what age is that that we can really stop? Yeah, so if you look at SIDS, really 99% of it or so occurs before one year of age. Mm -hmm. um, and most of it really occurs in about the four to eight month range. So it's really in the middle of that first year. So um, again, that one year um, point is partly magical because that's what we've used as a data point, um, but it really seems that by a year of age they've outgrown those um, whatever risk factors are in their brain. Okay. Now, if parents continue to have questions about safe sleep or SIDS, what what should they do? Who should they reach out to? So I think the best bet is to talk to your pediatrician about it. They'll mm -hmm. have all that information. Okay. Any final thoughts for our fans today? I just you know encourage everybody to do what's best for your kid um, and practice the ABCs of safe sleep. Try to breastfeed and not smoke. Right. And if anybody's curious to learn more about Children's Hospital of Wisconsin, you can visit our website at chw.org. Thank you so much.